Peter Norfolk, the owner of 1016 Industries. You're paying $300,000 for a car. Why is that not carbon fiber? Go design a kit, I'll buy five of them. Did it not frustrate you? I'm frustrated every day. Fair play. There's a lot of times as a business owner, this is not fun. It's cripplingly bad. Have you ever had times where you thought to yourself, I can't do this anymore? Yeah, like once a week. <laughs> Sometimes once a day. People don't understand the sacrifices that people that own companies make. You know, they're like, oh, you're the owner of the company, so it's easier for you. I'm like, you guys look at me. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing half the time. I was like, just make it up as I go. You know, they see they see the cars that I have. They see they see what the trips we go on. They're like, must be nice. I'm like, oh, you got to spend the weekend with your wife and your family. I was like, that must be nice. Yeah, but it's always greener on the other side. Have you found that as you climb up the ladder of success, you lose more of yourself? What is going on everyone? Welcome back to the CEO Cast, the number one podcast to showcase in business and entrepreneurship. Now today, you lot join me with a special guest all the way from the States. I'm with Peter Norfolk. How you doing, bro? I'm good. Yeah. Great. Just got back from Goodwood, so four days, pretty long. Let's let's start with that then. So owner of 1016 Industries. Yep. At Goodwood. So what was it week like been for you in a week of entrepreneur? What's it been like? Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, you know, we've been big in the United States. I mean, we've done quite a lot, pretty much all the events there, and you know, it's not not necessarily we got tired of it, but we we were looking for something different. Obviously, you know, Europe is something that we haven't tried to tackle yet. It's a, it was a pretty amazing show. Like it's uh it's very different from what we're what we're used to. The closest thing we have is Monterey Car Week, but yeah. there's no like real segregated show like that. Um, it was really interesting to see you know people's feedback on what we do in the U.S. and how it translates to what they want here. So it was really. It was a very unique, interesting experience. The display was unique for us in terms of how we normally do marketing. So it's been it's been really cool. So have you have you not opened up so much in, in European markets then? Yeah. Before we get into it, make sure you subscribe and set the bell notification to all so you never miss a single episode. Yeah, so we I mean, most people, you know, they see the presence online, they see the cars, they think we've been around a long time, but you know, yeah. realistically speaking, we've been around for five years. So um I've always been very cautious about not taking on more than we well, I always take on more than I can chew, but not not in terms of you know what we can build. I mean, we've been we've been building our manufacturing base since we started, and we just knew that we couldn't supply demand if we were popular here. Yeah, and we've gotten to a point now where we've built three very large manufacturing facilities. We have great partners now. Um, we'll talk about some of the other things we're going to come out with that complement what we do, but you know, we feel like we're in a position where we're able to supply that kind of volume and we're ready to do it. So that's why we decided to make the step at this point. Yeah, no, the reason why I asked is because I've seen so many, at least Lamborghini Euruses in the UK, at least with, you know, with your wide body kits. So I thought, okay, you've already been here, established here. So you being here in Goodwood over the weekend, was that your first time being here as a 1016 brand? Yeah, as 1016 is definitely the first time I've been here. I don't think I've been to the UK in probably 10 years. I mean, I used to come a lot. My grandparents lived here for a couple of years. So when I was younger, I was here. But, yeah. you know, I've always loved cars. I always noticed the car scene. I just really didn't know too much about it. So as 1016 is the first time we're here, we have been very successful with the Euros. I think I think we're pretty close to 20 wide body Euroses in, in the UK at this point. Which, yeah, that's crazy. You know, relatively speaking, and based on the market, it's it's pretty good. Um, you know, that, that seems to be globally what people have asked us for everywhere. No matter yeah. what market we're in, we have your assist there. And that's been kind of consistent from that, pl- that platform. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't do much of like the lower end cars. For example, I've come here in my M4, right? You don't have kits for that, do you? So it's the same, it's, it's kind of the same conversation. Um, it was a manufacturing power thing, um, when you can only make X amount of kits every single day, every week, every month you need to look at where's your best margin where's your best repeatability where's your your ease of of you know making kits and that's kind of where we've had to focus yeah i have a million different other things i would like to do um maybe not the bmw market i just think bmw mercedes audi for the most part it's very hard there's very inexpensive options and what we do is not inexpensive manufacturing i don't want to be in an you know, inexpensive manufacturing. So that's really the only reason we don't do it. Yes. Yeah, so it's not to say we can't. I just don't know that somebody would it would be feasible. Want to pay, you know, what what we would want to charge for those type of products. Yeah. Whereas if you're getting me on a six figure car plus, it's more likely for that's for someone to actually go with ten sixteen. Yeah. I mean it's you know, supercars and a lot of these cars, it's a it's an opportunity trade off, right? You know, you, you charge a lot more, but the opportunity the amount of vehicles on the road is a lot less. So you kinda gotta look at you know, what is, what is something that somebody wants to modify? What What is something that you're going to be able to supply properly? Where are you going to be able to make the margin? Because carbon fiber is not something that's easy to make consistent over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah, so if you're making $100, $100, $100 $200 on the spoiler, 
Yeah. As opposed to the same spoiler, you can make whatever, 10 times as much. You need, yeah. you, re, you need to look at your business model and, and grow appropriately. I mean, 100%. Like I said, could we do it? Yes. Do we want to do it? Right now, probably not. So let's bring it back then, right? Where did this all begin and start for you? I've loved cars since I was born. Like, it's it's just one of those things that, you know, I've fortunately or not known what I've meant to do in life my whole life. Um, automotive manufacturing and, and automotives in general is just something that clicks, clicks for me. Um, you know, I used to, my mom used to take me to the beach during the summer when I was three years old. She'd flip my stroller over and I'd just sit there. She, she could leave. I would play with the wheels on the stroller for like hours. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, you know, cars, you know, I used to put, you know, cut, cut uh, pictures of these cars out from the Motor Trend and all the, all the, the magazines and stick them on my wall. And I used to like, I literally my whole room. All scared kind of, of cars. All yeah. And I would just, you know, as they come out, replace, 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 yeah. replace. And, you know, it's kind of been like little pinch me moments. What, what were the cars at the time, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I mean, it kind of varied. I mean, at the time, that was like when the first Holy Trinity came out, which one of them sitting right here behind okay. us, yeah, the, yeah. the Enzo, the Carrera GT and uh, the SLR. So, you know, that was, you know, for me, like the Enzo is one of the coolest things, you know, uh, the P1 as well. I'm just one of those people that it's not just about cars, but it's about the evolution of cars and thinking outside of the box and things existing that you never thought would exist. And okay. That's, especially right now, it's kind of exciting where cars are, are at. So why does it excite you? Because I think, you know, people didn't really think about the evolution of hybrid or batteries as ever something that would really be a part. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of really, really cool cars that are coming out right now, which are, you know, F1 technology, race cars, limited production, you know, very bespoke cars that are coming from, you know, production companies and they're all getting sold out. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting time to have, you know, a very, a very unique car that, not many other people have and that mm. for me is what's exciting yeah um these these you know limited creations where you see all these you know limited run oems and small companies popping up and they're able to survive thrive and and really give the customer something that's you know amazing like look look at the new conus that just came out it's 2350 horsepower in a four-seater like and do you know one thing i don't understand about it is how they've managed to get i think it's 600 horsepower out of a three-cylinder engine which is crazy oh, i think it's the the it's 1300 yeah yeah. Even, even crazy. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like I, I, I trained and, and you know, what I was trained and went to school for was high efficiency internal combustion design. Yeah. So for me, I get it. Like, like, but it's really cool seeing like some of these things that, you know, I, I decided that, you know, being a, an internal combustion engineer, I was like, okay, my time would be very limited in terms of a career. E. And so I, I really, really appreciate it. You know, I spent eight years going to school, looking at alternative fueling, high efficiency, you know, small engines, you know, how can you get the most power out of it? So for me, it's super interesting, but it's, you know, they've taken it to a level that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. You know, with the new technology with turbos, um, with calibration and stuff like that. I'm very specifically well-versed with calibration. That's something that's always stuck with me. So it's, it's really interesting seeing these, you know, the high, high displacement get replaced with turbos, you know, twin superchargers, you know, and then adding the electric component to that. I think the first time we really saw it is with the new Holy Trinity, for example, the P1 LaFerrari mm -hmm. 918, you know, hybrids essentially, and that changed the game fully. Yeah, but look at the P1, it was 2013. Yeah. That's why it's, it's still to this day probably my favorite car. It just was out of nowhere. You have a thousand plus horsepower hybrid car, like nothing else existed existed like that yeah yeah well let's let's take it back then so so you're at this age now where you're putting posters all over your wall in your bedroom for all these cars how did it transpire from, on from there i mean i'm lucky enough that you know i i shared that that passion in my family um my family loves cars and we all do so you know i always kept myself around cars i always you know my first car was a um an s4 dtm 25th anniversary would be seven so you know i kind of you know, I was fortunate enough that I, I had that around me and, you know, somehow, like I said, I, I always kept cars around and that I, you know, I was planning to go to school to play lacrosse. Like I was an athlete. Like that's what I thought I was going to do with my life. Yeah. It was very good. And, you know, as a joke, we went down to uh, Miami to, for vacation and there were, you know, they had an engineering program. I always said, I want to go to college in a city with grass. My mom's like, oh, let's go look at University of Miami. Complete mm -hmm. joke. And I sat down with these two professors of brothers that were in charge of the internal combustion 
program at University of Miami, and I literally, there's just like, it was like one of those moments I sat down, I was like, okay, I have to go here. Mm. Like, it legitimately was a joke. I'm like, yes. I was going to go to Yale or somewhere up north in the Northeast or something like that, and I just like sat down with these people, and I was listening. You know, they had 35, 40 years worth of knowledge in internal combustion engine design. I just sat there and clicked with me, and I was like, all right, this is what I have to do. Um, you know, the carbon, fi I, I, I had a day job. I ran a high-performance shop in Miami, um, for the entire time I was in college. I worked. Your own business? Or? No, no, I worked for somebody else. So I ran, it was uh, basically a high-end boutique, um, building cars, you know, aftermarket, whatever. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, started to get into that side of the business there and, you know, fell in love with that side too. Um, I think, you know, my mind is very creative. I always want to like make new things. And the carbon fiber moment, actually, I, I had a tuning business before. Like I built a tuning business while I was running that shop. Um, and you know, like I said, when I, when I looked at where the market was going, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to school for engine design. I was like, there's, there's only so many different things you could do. And so, um, one of my really good friends owns Lamborghini Miami. And when the Huracan came out, he called me, he's like, Hey, the car's going to be here next weekend. I was like, we're doing a private viewing. Come, come look at it. Is it before the car's released or? Yeah, it was before the car's released. Yeah. So, so nobody had seen it yet. I had no idea what to expect. I was like, oh, that's cool, you know. Yeah. I got invited to a private reveal. And when we went in there, took our phones, you know, nobody could see it, whatever. And we just looked at the back. It was an LP610. Just looked at the back of it. And it was like, it's a huge piece of plastic. I'm like, it's a $300,000 Lamborghini. Why is it plastic? Did it look unfinished? Yeah, it just, it's, to me, it was like, you're, you're paying $300,000 for a car. Why is that not carbon fiber? Yeah. Um. So that kind of like started from there. You know, Brett was like, okay, Go design a kit. I'll buy five of them. I had no idea what I was doing. This is the owner of Lamborghini Miami. Yeah. Okay. I had no idea what I was doing. No resources. I just made some phone calls. We found some guy that was able to do it by hand on the car. Yeah. Um, made a set of molds, you know, non-autoclave carbon fiber. Made a very, very pretty kit. Like, I still to this day, it's one of my favorite kits. Did it fit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a pain. I, I learned a lot the first six months. Let, let's dive into that for a second, yeah? Yeah. From when you sold the car to when you had your first kit, yeah? How long did it actually take for you to build that kit? Honestly, it really wasn't that bad. Like, we, we had to wait. So so this is where the process changed. So we had to wait for a production car to get there. Mm -hmm. I actually went and tried to learn how to 3D scan a car myself. Yeah. So in the first production car, I, I already told the client, we already had somebody lined up, like, and I was like, I rented a 3D scanner. Like, this is like... 2015 so at least it was a very very different thing mm -hmm. and when i tell you i have never again tried to 3d scan a car <laughs> never again because i had no idea what i was doing i talked to the people they're like this is so easy like oh you just you just you know you just track it and then you put dots and then you make sure you stitch it yeah, together yeah, like yeah, yeah. we'll do the post post process for you and i was yeah. like oh this is great yeah i was like why is this so hard swear to god i i literally trashed the entire whatever i scanned you don't know all you scanned so i was just like I was like, all right, digital's not gonna work. Like, yeah. So we, we had somebody do it by hand on the vehicle. Um, and that process probably took two, three months. But again, I was in the East Coast. This is what, for the hurricane. I'm just gonna interrupt this and say, we are at TV London right now. So if there are any hurricanes or ventadors that start, I apologize. Yeah, so anyway, long story short, it probably took us three, four months. But it was, you know, uh, somebody that designed body kits in the industry in SoCal and they were hand doing it on the Huracan. We were going back and forth, sending pictures at three o'clock in the morning, my time, you yeah. know, like I then eventually found, found a local manufacturer in SoCal to make the kit. And, you know, there was a lot of things that it was, it was a very ambitious kit, even for somebody that was experienced because, you know, that full rear diffuser was a very, very complicated part. Yeah. Um, and again, threw myself right into a situation where I didn't know how difficult it was. So, Definitely, you know, it was, was a very steep learning curve. Okay, so, so going into it, when you saw that bomb pod, did it spark a business idea in your head or was it like just a passion project just to complete this car, to look at this car? It was a passion thing. Like, like I, I, it's funny, now we look at everything five years later and we're like, how's, how does this functionally support our business model? How does it support our growth? How does this support, you know, like, it, it is a little disappointing to me sometimes that the the business side of things sometimes takes over the passion side. Yeah. Because that's really why I do what I do and that's how how I actually push myself. You know, I'm I'm that passionate about cars and that was you know, like you said with the Huracan, I was like, 
you know, like it was a, it's still a great car, like fantastic platform, but it mm-hmm. was like, you know, we can do this better or we yeah. can make it better. So you made the diffuser now and you've now you've got a whole kit for the, for the hurricane, right? We have literally a whole hurricane for the hurricane. Yeah. Like we have a full replacement <laughs> wide body, including doors. Like yeah. we've done, we've, you know, we've done full, including exposed. doors as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've, we've done, I think four full exposed hurricanes. Yeah. One's gold carbon, one's green carbon, one's regular carbon and the other one's satin carbon. So it, we, we literally, you know, <laughs> again, we, I, I'm only pushing myself to see what I can do better. Yeah. But it's like, you know, within three years of being in business, we were doing full exposed wide body hurricanes. Like, yeah. Are these all in the States? Uh, no, actually. Uh, well, most of them are. Um, two of them are local to us in SoCal. One of them is still in Montana, and then there's one in Dubai now. Okay. The green carbon one's in Dubai. That yeah. car is sick. Yeah. It's crazy because you don't ever see cars like that in the UK here. The most amount of modifications you see is something maybe like George's 720S, yeah. where he's wrapped it orange, got white wheels on there, and then they keep it like that, right? You might get an odd exhaust here and there, but you never really see someone have the balls to wide body an SV or Hurricane or something along them lines. This episode is sponsored by Fireway Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK. With over 100 locations, you definitely have a store near you. The founder of Fireway was on the show not too long ago and you can get a slice of the action by using the discount code CEOcast at fireway.co.uk. Once again, use the discount code CEOcast at fireway.co.uk. I mean, I think it's something that, you know, that I, again, I've been having as many conversations as I can to understand the market and well, you know, we were talking about the G 400 and we'll get there later, but like things that I, I just don't know, you know, like I, I know what the cars in America want. I know, you know, a lot, a lot of different markets, but here's a little bit unique. You know, I think, I think it's one of those things and we've said it before, people don't really know that they need it or want it until they see it. Yeah. And that's where we've been kind of successful. And that's why you see me and the cars everywhere. Like, you know, we've been successful because we go out and we show the cars, we take them, you know, my 720 has been everywhere. You know, it's actually probably going to come here as well, Mm -hmm. which is something we've been talking about. But would you bring it here purely for marketing purposes or? Yeah. I mean, I don't really know how to take a vacation. Technically, this week is supposed to be a vacation, but it's always works. I'm booked the whole time working. Um, So, you know, like that's one of those cars where people just don't understand how much went into it the little details like it's full blue exposed carbon like full full body mm-hmm. and people don't really get it even seeing it in california they like walk up to it they're like oh it's a really cool paint that's not paint yeah that's <laughs> carbon fiber so it's oh, like yeah. you know i think here you have roads that are difficult i think europe was roads, car parks and stuff like that yeah. like you know that are that are difficult so you know that's where we're looking at products that you know still give people um you know, a u- unique experience where it's their own car yeah. without, you know, messing around with some of the stuff we can get away with in the U.S. Yeah, 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 I mean, we sure. saw we saw two Liberty Walk cars, a Urus and a, and a Venturer across the booth from us at Goodwood. Yeah. And I know of like three or four Venturers here, whatever, that are that are local. They're not, you know, flown in from Saudi or something like that that, right. you know, exist here. And like I said, our Urus wide body, we probably have 20 of them here. So I think it's a matter of... It's- it's funny because the place that does a lot of your wide body uruses are the ones that wrapped from my uh my car. Yeah. So when I when I went there to pick it up, I saw three wide body uruses back to back. Oh yeah, we were just there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, you know, so, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna do some filming with them and he's you know, great great company. He's done a great job for us. You know, we, we, we have a couple installers here, you know, we're we're just trying to come up with a business plan here that makes sense. But, you know, as I said, you know, cars are something that a lot of people see as an identity. Mm. Um, it's something that they're very passionate about. It's something, you know, whether whether you're passionate about modifying it or not, or whether you're like the CEO of a company, like it's it's one of those symbols that people see and identify with yeah. that say a lot about who they are. It's almost an extension of your personality. Yeah, and that's why I think, you know, yes, you don't see it in the market, but I think access, and these guys at GVE have shown it, access to being able to finance, get approved, and get into these vehicles mm. is something that has taken time, even in the U.S. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have 20-something-year-old influencers now that can drive Huracans. Yeah, 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 for sure. If you had told me that 10 years ago. Yeah, you would think, no way. No, no, you have to be like a business owner. Like yeah. there was a very, There's a very different like perspective of what it takes to own that vehicle, oh, yeah. which I think is all positive and negative. 
But, you know, it took time in the U.S. and I think it'll take time to filter through here. But, you know, again, people are getting more access to these vehicles. And then we've come up with creative solutions, how you can find out parts into the vehicle as well, mm -hmm. whether it's pre-built or, or whatever it is, you know, that gives them the opportunity to make even something that special their own. Let me ask you this, yeah. As you said there, 20-year-old influencer can now get into a hurricane, right? Yeah. Do you think... With them, uh, uh, like the way people can access his cars, any age group, any person, anyone can really buy a Hurricane. Yeah. Obviously, depending on what they do. Yeah. yeah. Influence our business on all that sort of stuff. Do you think it then filters out the spe speciality of these cars? And then, for example, if you want the special one, if you want to stand out, you then have to go to their Ventador or Ventador SV. But I mean, like, it's hard for us because we're like, we're saturated in it. Yeah. Like, I feel like there are SVJs everywhere. Yeah. Like, for me. And, you know, it's it's hard to step out of that perspective and see that just one of these cars is something that most people in life don't have the opportunity to have. And so, you know, yeah, I think, I think um, whether it's social media, whether it's the way of the world, whether it's the new generation, you know, there is an expectation that every 21-year-old should have a Huracan or a yeah, 570. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very odd to me because, like, most of... You know, I, I'm on the cusp. I'm, I'm 34. Like, I, I've always been very ahead on the social media side, but, like, I don't have Snapchat. I don't, like, I'm too old for that. Yeah. So, like, but there's a whole other generation, and it's, like, I feel like they have this pressure that they have to have this stuff. But, like, my parents, for example, like, it was have this type of cars. Yeah. Like, my mom, I still think, thinks I deal drugs or something. I don't know. Like, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a very different, um, it's a very different perspective on the vehicles. It's more, you know, very... I'm not saying they're less special, but it, it's uh, it's it's almost become like an expectation that you should be able to have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to throw it back to your business, right? Yeah. So at the point of when you had this passion project and you'd installed it on this car, when did you then click in your head, this actually could be a business now? I mean, everything for me has always been a, a business idea. You know, I, I, I've always wanted to design my own car. Mm -hmm. and as in I, a whole car from scratch yeah, yeah yeah i still think we'll get there yeah like i know not i think i know we'll get there and i i've been around people that have done that mm -hmm. you know norman Choi from day tomas and apollo i have a great relationship with i have appreciated you know the conversations we've had you know but like everything for me has always been stepping towards um getting to a much larger vision mm -hmm. um you know i looked at the aftermarket industry as a client and was disappointed by, um, you know, the delivery, the customer service, the product quality, stuff like that. And so, you know, I, I come from the OEM side of things. After college, I went and worked um, for Alpha Maserati in the OEM space. You know, I have a very different perspective of how products can and should be made. And for me, like, you know, like we really wanted to show that it's possible to have that same level of product. Mm -hmm. It's possible to do that and it's possible to deliver it. You know, that, you know, for me, like I said, it's passion, but it's also always been a business. It's always been a business, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned there you used to work in Alpha, right? And yeah. all these companies. So before 1016 actually started, what was your full day job at that time? Uh, so I was running like a high performance shop in Miami. Okay, so you were still doing that at that point then? Well, after I left college, then I went to go do... I was I was in internal combustion engineering with yeah. Alpha, Maserati, and yeah. it spilled over into Jeep as well because of the two-liter four-cylinder turbo that came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the main engines I was working that on. That was in the 4C, right? Uh, no, no, not the 4C. It was um, it was in the, the Julia. Okay. The Julia, and then it was in actually like the Jeep Wrangler and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah, it was yeah. like a crossover two-liter platform. That So I was actually in the engineering department and learned quite a lot about that whole industry and how that whole industry works, which ties into like another part of our business that we've been working on that a lot of people don't really know about because um, we don't we don't really talk about it. All they see is the flashy, fun stuff. Yeah. But, you know, I, I got to see, like I said, how, how a development process of a car goes from that side. And then after that, I actually went and worked for a tier one supplier to the OEMs and I got to manage 800 million plus of business with Ford, GM uh, and all the EV companies. So I got a lot of exposure to EV companies yeah. when nobody really knew who they were. Yeah. Um, so I got to learn both sides of how a product should get developed, how it can get developed, and and like a really a lot of really interesting knowledge about things that aren't done very well in automotive manufacturing. Yeah. It's a very old, very archaic, very slow process. 
and there's a lot there's a lot of opportunities to improve it and that's something that we've been working on with our products because our products are i would say much lower on a liability standpoint like going through and developing an oem product you have a lot of liability yeah so i'm trying to figure out with our parts okay how can we integrate new technologies to make what we do in a more efficient way and then offer that process and that opportunity to a lot of people smaller niche oems i don't think i ever want to get to a point where i'm doing oem carbon for mclaren or anything like that because carbon fiber is not a very fun thing to make in volume as i said but yep. there's an opportunity where like niche manufacturers smaller companies where they're making less than 100 cars you know a bumper mold for 300,000 parts a year is 300 grand yeah it's 300 grand if you're making 100 cars in traditional manufacturing format so we're trying to figure out okay how can we create a different process that's more cost effective to allow these niche oems the opportunity to make you know better decisions better volumes better margins make them more efficient for them correct yeah because i think there's a huge there's a huge opportunity as i said you know we've seen that as you know these you know, the these hypercars supercars have become more mainstream that people are really going for the even more rare more unique, more off brands, you know, you've seen five or 10 hypercar companies pop up. It's yeah. because people are looking for that unique experience. And like I said, that development process to build a very limited amount of cars is the same cost as these guys that are doing hundreds of thousands of copy paste vehicles every year. So yeah, it's like, absolutely. how do you, how do you allow that business to grow that model to, to grow, allow people's creativity in, at a cost-effective way. Don't you think you're going to have that sort of, you're going to have to think about that problem. As you said, you wanted to build your own cars and you're going to get there one day. But that's what we're doing. You know, like the, the, the aftermarket is, for me, it's a way to get my creative side happy. Yep. Like my brain never stops. It's really irritating. My team hates me. I wake up every morning and I have a new thing that I want to do, but I've learned to ask first <laughs> instead of being like, Hey guys, I just designed this whole thing. Let's yeah, go sell it. Let's build, build it right now. So that keeps my, the, the afterburner keeps my creative happy. It's, it's a great margin business. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to make money there, but really we pour all of our stuff back into longer term goals of, you know, how can we make parts better, more efficient, um, more cost effective. And then, like I said, we really, really, we really have a goal, especially with the expansion we're going to do in the next year or so really have a goal of being able to offer design prototyping production for smaller, um, more niche, you know, maybe not OEMs, but eventually there, you know, smaller, smaller batch um, projects. And, you know, some of our clients are extremely wealthy as well. There's some of the most successful people in the world. And if, you know, they want a one off for something, you know, we can They'll go through it. the whole design process and do that. Yeah. Correct. And it's, and it's reasonable. Yeah. You know, we, we, we have clients that, you know, come to us all the time and they really, really want to do these projects. And we want to be able to offer something for to them that, you know, maybe you can't order from McLaren or something like Anywhere that. Else, so, yeah. That's yeah. what I was say. That's the awesome thing about it. Like I said, you know, we're in this day and age where anyone can really access our work and obviously depending on, you know, their job title essentially, right? Yeah. But for them people who want to stand out that much more, they can come to you and say, look, I'm ready. Let's build a full car from scratch, from the ground up. Let's get different elements from them. Every single other car, let's build something magical here. And that I mean, process there would be... I mean, I don't know if we could get that far at this point, but yeah. like, we literally, my, my 720S is as, inspiration close, though, yeah. is as close to that process as possible. Yeah. Well, like, what have you done to your 720S that's as close to that possible? I mean, that process? that that body was a two-year project. It, you know, we did a full aero scan of the car factory. Mm -hmm. We did weight analysis. We did, you know, almost 16 months of redesign. Cause I really wanted a fixed swing on a 720. I wanted like um, a circuit racing type of kit for that car. Yep. I was like, it's pretty, it's gorgeous, great platform, but I want to do something different with it. I was like, I want to see if for half a million dollars, you can build something that's as good or better than a Santa or something like that. And so, you know, we have replaced every single part of that car. The entire body of that car is what our kit is, including the doors. Um, you know, so we went through and did, you know, layup analysis where we could take weight out of carbon, where we could, where we needed strength, where we didn't aero analysis, stuff like that. And that, 
you know, we, we have a full wheel program. We have a custom, you know, iBox suspension setup that we made custom for the weight and the downforce of the kit. Mm -hmm. So we have our own adjustable suspension there. You know, you got to take everything into account. Yeah, yeah. Everything's into account. And then, you know, we have obviously worked with calibration partners. You know, I don't do calibration personally anymore, but we, we have calibration partners where I was part of the process of this is how I wanted the car to dynamically perform based on what else mm -hmm. we did. So we have very specific calibrations, our own exhaust. Um, you know, we have some partners on the turbo side, the intercooler, stuff like that, where we have five or six different maps that based on where we would be and what we want to do with the car, it, it all kind of like combines together. So, you know, you're taking an incredible platform that McLaren created and seeing, you know, how can we create this into a different experience? Yeah. Again, because we have 765 and 2720s, we, you know, we, we drive them all the time and they're all very different experiences. How does that one compare? The one you've built, how does that compare? It's it's a handful like really it's 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 a it's a complete different experience but is it still drive like a 720 or is yeah. it it's different because it's 400 pounds lighter yeah it's 120 millimeters 150 millimeters wider i mean peak peak uh the highest map it's 1150 horsepower okay you know after 120 miles an hour the car just sinks sinks on the road like it it, it it's very very different and it's a rocket like it's just I'm kind of that fast. being in. I need to find videos of that and put, overlay that in this podcast because that yeah, is unreal because, and, and again mine's full exposed carbon yeah I put 19,000 miles on that car like Bit it driver, black, yeah, yeah, yeah it was black exposed carbon and it, you know now it's blue and black because blue is my favorite color and again we redid the entire interior of the car it used to be black and orange now it's full blue Alcantara leather you know whatever it looks like an MSO you know factory interior which is something that I never thought we would do. Yeah. Um, but that car really is, you know, 100% us. And that's that's something that, you know, six years into business, didn't really think we could do it. Wasn't really sure that I was making an intelligent choice. And I was testing a whole bunch of technologies at the time that nobody else was doing. I mean, I 3D printed the entire body kit in full scale yeah. and drove the car around like that. <laughs> no way. Yeah. So it's I- A little sketchy at all. Yeah, it's pretty sketchy, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd, say, I'd say that's being polite. And I, there's actually a video. There's a video of my car driving around full of 3D printed. It was, yes. You need to see that video. It was interesting, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think if I wasn't in Michigan in the middle of winter, stuff might have melted. But, yeah. you know, it was really cold outside, so... Yeah, then you were going, right. the car didn't catch on fire. This is actually a really interesting podcast for me, right? Because I've seen so many of your builds done by RDB yep. uh, in LA, right? Yeah. You know, they've done so many 720s. You've seen so many Hurricanes and Aventadors come in there. And your cars, the kits and your cars, I've always said it to everyone person I know that they look the sickest out, all the manufacturers and, you know, that you can have offer in terms of aftermarket, yours are the best and they look the sickest. I mean, it, thank you, because that means a lot. But that's, you know, our design philosophy is is more so we want it to look like it was supposed to be that way. We don't want you to know that it's a kit. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, I think a lot of other people add, like, dive canards, flippers, yeah. fins, like, yeah, 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 yeah. stick off, and it's like... But I suppose to anyone, I'm a Petrohead, so I suppose to anyone who knows what a factory of um, Hurricane looks like and then sees your one, obviously they'll know that the stuff's been changed on that. But it's subtle in a good way, where that's how it should have come from factory in the first place. No, and like my 720, that, that's why I take it everywhere. Everyone's like, everyone has no idea what it is. Yeah. Like, is that a P1? Is it a Senna? Is it a 720? They have no idea what it is. And, it, you know, we spent, you know, that was something where we have, there's a program where you can actually artificially throw light into your design with mm -hmm. with 3D virtual goggles. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. And you, you get to see how how the sun would play off the car. And that, like, my, my designer and I probably reiterated, there's a, on the quarter panel, there's an open vent now, and there's, like, a merge of, like, four different lines mm -hmm. that need to blend together. And I think the two of us spent four months just working on how to make that blend the best. Yeah. Because you knew, like... It, it, just seeing the light on, I think we drove each, drove each other crazy. Yeah, I could imagine. Literally, we did 15 different iterations and we were using 3D printed, uh, th like a large format 3D printer that we were developing with a partner and we were reprinting it every time and putting it on my car. Like, I, I have my 720 in 2019. Nobody saw that car until 2021. Yeah. Like, the car was apart for two years. So it was like an amazing amount of delayed gratification. I had a 720, brand new, 700 miles sitting there, torn apart for two years. Yeah, that's working crazy. On this. That's crazy. So, so, you know, that's another thing about us. Like it, it, we, we really want to, we want to add value with the product. I don't just want to stick a spoiler on because it looks cool. You know, I have it in my head that I really want to make sure that when these, when the customer is going 200 miles an hour, that it's doing the right thing. You know, I want to make sure it's secured properly. You know, like I, I don't have it in me to just 
throw products on cars for no reason. You know, like we want to know if it's going to be lighter. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our Porsche company is called Nine Design, and all the stuff for the Porsches, which we did the GT 991s first, is full replacement. I wanted to ask you about this. Why why didn't you put that under 1016? Because it's a very different clientele. Like I think I think we can have a lot more fun marketing with 1016. Yeah. And I don't think those clients with the Porsches really appreciate it. So like me standing on top of my McLaren. Do you feel like that because of the, the the Porsche family are like proper enthusiasts where they they don't want the cars touched in that way and having the same bracket as 1016? I just think it's a different batch of people. Like I said, you know, these these younger influencers that'll do crazy things, that'll that'll buy these type of products, they're not really looking to get into a Turbo S. Yeah. It's just not... Yeah, yeah it's not a thing. It's not flashy. Yeah, the first yeah. car they're going to get is a Hurricane. Correct. Or so McLaren. It's, 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 um, it's a very different feeling. And, you know, I, I'm very respectful of the Porsche clientele. I think Porsche has built an incredible brand and they have incredibly loyal people for a reason. Mm -hmm. Like... The Porsches on the track and just quality build and, and everything that they do is it's spectacular. And so I have a, I have a, a different perspective of what we can get away with on that, and that's why we really wanted to separate the brand that way. I want to go all the way back to the Hurricane, right? Yeah. When you first started out, you complete this Hurricane. You said over three years you were then doing essentially full wide body kits for the Hurricane. Yeah. What was next after the Hurricane? What was what? What was next after the Hurricane? So you done this Hurricane now? The event our, we took a swing and we missed. How well, how soon after the hurricane was that? Uh, I think it was. Um, so the event our, so the event came out way before. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. we tried to like partner. You know, hey, we have a great hurricane kit. Or like, let's jump on the event our crowd four years after everybody else did. Mm. And you know, we didn't have any of the digital capabilities still. And it, you know, we we had some things that were really good. But like, I also tried to tackle the active wing on the event when nobody else had tackled it, which we did. But I'm not saying we did it delicately or eloqu eloquently. I think we could have done a lot better. But, I, you know, we, we came out with the kit, you know. And then the hood on the Huracan and the hood on the Aventador, I think we started a trend there that nobody even thought about. Because, like, it, we came out with the base Huracan kit. And I told everybody, I was like, you know, I really want to do a hood. And everyone's like, you're never going to sell that. Like, I going to buy a hood for a Huracan. 500 hurricane hoods later <laughs> yeah it's That's like crazy. you know like so so then we started to do it on the the ventador too and it's you know hoods and wings are are our bread and butter that's something that sells every single day but it was something that nobody was doing and so you know it's taken a level of trust in myself to be like okay well it's great that you don't think the product's gonna sell but we we go and do it anyway yeah i mean because in terms of you know expense it's almost like an inexpensive way to make your car stand out so much more yeah, just from the hood. A, it's such a big panel. Yeah. The other thing is, is like whether yeah, you know, you don't have to paint it, and it's something you can swap yeah. right back off. Yeah, yeah, literally. You know, so we're, you know, that's another thing about us that we're very cognizant about is is uh, reversing the cars back. Like you're never going to see a product from me that drills, screws, cuts. Yeah. I don't want to do it. I mean, obviously, placement. Obviously, there's certain exceptions. Like if we get into doing like a wide body on an F8 or something like that, you got to cut the quarter panel. It doesn't yeah, come yeah, off. Yeah. But for the most part, we're we're very cognizant about you know the fact that people do finance these cars, they do turn them back in, and some of them don't buy them, so maybe they don't want the product to stay on the car. Have we ever taken a wide body off of an Urus before? No, but you can, like legitimately, like if it's installed properly, you could take that whole Urus kit off. And I, there's actually a viral video of somebody tearing her. I think from Russia or something like that, like a green nurse is ripping the whole body kit apart and like ripping it off and stuff. But, you know, so, uh, you know, that's, that's something else we've thought about. It's like, okay, we don't, we don't, we don't, we want to modify the car. We don't want to, but we don't want to physically modify the car where it can't be put back to stock. Yeah, or yeah, if yeah. you've got drill holes, you've got, you you know, they paint it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because day. again, we do work on some now more mainstream cars, but like some of these cars are super special. Like our SF90 kit, I do not want to paint an SF90. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's <laughs> it's been a, again, it's interesting. We came out with some kits that are very good that came out when the market just crashed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, I think in the next couple of months, you'll start seeing a lot of SF90s. We're going to start pushing the RS6 hard here because I love that kit, love yeah. Audi. I That's think people will appreciate the R6 hair as well, 100%. Yeah, and then the 992 Turbo S. So we, yeah. we kind of came out with a batch of kits that, um, you know, the market slowed down, cars weren't available, interest rates came up. You know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. And, you know, we 
we have a lot of products that are ready for the world to come back to the normal cycle of things. And I yeah. think, you know, last couple of years also has not been normal. You know, people were locked in their houses and the only thing, they couldn't travel, they couldn't spend money on food, they weren't doing anything. All they did was spend money on their cars. It was great for us, but it was unrealistic. So I think you'll start to see some of those projects that we weren't able to market. We're focusing on those again. SF90 is one of them. But again, you know, all of our stuff on the SF90 is add-on mm -hmm. and it's something you can take off the vehicle without, without. without paint, without anything. You know, yeah. so, you know, back in the day, if you had paint, any paintwork on your exotic, which I still think it is for the most part, but if you had paintwork on your exotic, somebody checked it and said there was paintwork on the car, it was a, a big red flag. Yeah. It would decrease the value of the car. People wouldn't want to buy it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so that that's something that, you know, maybe it's not as realistic anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I still think obviously it's a thing if you're talking about like a collector car, like these SVs and stuff like that, where yeah, they're yeah. cars that- get you, you don't want any the tiny signs of, you know, respray or anything like that. Yeah, but like, you know, for example, again, going back to like people trying to be creative, you have people repainting Carrera GTs. Yeah. Like, um, it. like if it's not what they wanted at the time, you know, yeah. obviously the, the even the factory is doing it. You know, there's a heritage program for Porsche. There's the uh, heritage program for the SLR. I have a client that sent three SLRs back to get redone mm. by MSO. You know, like it's really, really interesting seeing how the market is adapting to wanting to be unique yeah like you're taking cars that are super special and you're like no nah, it's not special enough i remember the first time i really saw it is um it was a few years ago there's a youtuber by the name of solomondrin in the u.s yeah yeah they grew a gt yep yeah 100 exactly that and he you know resprayed it i think it was called ruby pink the color correct and i just thought that's crazy you know you're taking a, a car that's how much is it worth in the states 1.6 1.6 million. million yeah exactly that and Very you're spraying the whole thing yeah, and it's the same, you know, obviously Raps has done a lot for people too, yeah. where like everybody's, you know, using Raps as a unique thing, but like you have people that are like doing the LM kits on their F40, like it's like, it's crazy. Like I, in a great way, like I, I'm all about it. Like every car I've floor, ever yeah. owned, like I, if I tell anybody I'm not going to modify it, like I just get laughed at. Yeah. Like my 765, we put 8,000 miles on, It's it's got, you know, modifications on it, you know, from us, like whatever but like every car that i own it's gonna get modified i just that's just my my thing it's it's it what makes me done. happy and you know like done. we've like i said we found clients that'll take these very very special cars and they're like it's not special enough make it more special i want something more yeah yeah, yeah. yeah and and that that to me is what's exciting you know like it, we, we have a very you know we have three sectors well i think now four sectors of our business where we cater to different people and how they feel about the cars. You have the people that, you know, they want a spoiler and a hood on their Huracan, they're 21 years old, you know, that's something they can use for content. You know, there's there's that there's that niche. Then there's all the luxury SUV people, yeah. which is a whole crowd of people. Then there's the, you know, the supercar people. And then there's the hypercar people that, you know, their hypercar is not good enough. Mm. And we really want to provide a full experience for anybody that wants to make their car unique. And, and we've kind of tailored our entire company around, okay, you know, how do we create one kit, but then make it a unique experience? You know, we have Forge Carbon. We were one of, the, we were the first person. I still think the only person that does it right, the way the OEM does it, because I know the OEM process. Um, you know, we have colored carbon. We have like, like a uh, metallic flake we can put in. So like the gold yeah. Aircon, it goes outside and it like sparkles. Sparkles, yeah. Um, you know, we have satin. We have a whole different thing. You know, whatever you want to do, we're able to do it and, and give you kind of a, uh, a vehicle that's yours. And that's yeah, yeah. that's kind of well, what I want. Proper, like you said, going back to your identity. Yeah. Where do you think, yeah, looking back at it now, the big spot and the, the way you actually made a big statement and a name for yourself when 1016 was now on the map. This episode is sponsored by Energy Geeks. Energy Geeks are a leading utility consultancy specializing in battling the rising prices of business utilities in the market. They specialize in the procurement of business energy contracts and their direct relationships allow them to find the most competitive prices on the market, helping you find out exactly what you want and need. They can also help facilitate the change of tenancies, sort out any billing issues you may have, or simply offer you the most transparent advice available. The list of what they could do is endless. So head to the website energygeeks.co.uk. The link is on the screen right now also in the description check out and see what they can do for you it was the urus the urus yeah yeah it's for sure yeah it's funny because uh i would have thought it was way before that no because the urus was the urus was uh 2019 so i mean you think about it we started started late 15 we did really well with the hurricane like don't get me wrong like yeah i i only had a hurricane kit for like that was like my thing for the first couple of years 
and then we were looking, you know, for, for what was next. And I remember again, my, my really good friend, Brett, he, he was like, there's a little, there's an SUV coming out. He's like, you, you have to do this. And he kept pushing me, kept pushing me, kept pushing me. I was like, I don't want to do it. Who's going to modify it? You're gonna modify a SUV, a SUV Urus, like yeah. Lamborghini. Who's gonna do that? Like nobody cares. Yeah, and yeah, people cared. <laughs> I think, I think, I think we've probably, you know, it's the best looking one by four. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, we we came up with a design concept that worked, which we've already finished the S and the Performante, which you'll start to see here. Yeah. We're already sending a Performante kit here. We're already sending S kits here. I already have. 10 of each being built around the world right now like yeah. you'll see we we learned from our original experience with the current earth and we find it even more but it, you know like it's it's crazy to me like that was that was the moment where we started getting phone calls from all over the world and again it, you know it was like an organic thing like we didn't we didn't do the marketing that we're doing now we didn't do targeted campaigns we didn't do influence or anything it, it was like organically people were coming to us but even so, you know, like I would get so upset. I'm like, some of our competitors, I'm like, oh, everybody, you know, in that region's buying that. I was like, okay, they've been around 40, 50 years. What do you want? Mm. Like, you know, I'm a very impatient person, but I have to really pull myself back and be like, yeah, I was, I was it's okay. You're that, six years old. Like, that, yeah, relax. That, that was on my mind right now. You know, being six years into this business, obviously, you know, we'll leave the Euros aside for a second, but six years into the business and you're not hitting that point of where you're thinking, I need to get on the map. Did it not frustrate you in any way? Did what? Did it not frustrate you? I'm frustrated every day. <laughs> Fair play. But <laughs> like no matter, but that's the thing. Like that, that's that's how it is. You know, I never take a second to realize. I mean, I think we're, I think we're over 40, 40 body kits. Yeah. In six years at this point, like, I think we're the only person that has every hurricane done. Like we just finished the Technica too. Like, yeah. you know, I, I never give myself a break because that's just who I am as a person. But like, you know it's really nice coming and, you know, sharing our experience with other people and then be like, Oh, we love your brand. Like whatever. I, I still, to this day, like it, you know, I don't remember exactly when it was, but like, I, I think it was, it was uh 2021 where I was like, I slowed down for a second. I started to like look on social media. I started to look around and I'm like, dude, it was just so cool that my friends were like, to my friends that were like, this, this is stupid. Like, why are you doing this? Like they started texting me a picture to be like, Oh, I just saw one of your Huracans. I saw a 720. Like I saw your forged carbon. Like, everybody started to see our stuff everywhere and it just was like one of those moments where you're like that's pretty cool yeah like there's people with supercars that have our stuff all around the world like and, and I, you know but last six months has been you know it's been hard for everybody it's been frustrating and you know i haven't you know reason i'm here for this week because i'm taking a week off for the first time since i started this business regardless what's going on and i'm like all right relax take a week enjoy yourself and then you know like go back at it because you know a lot of a lot of people think this is just fun it's amazing like you're on these cars and it's like a lot of the time this isn't fun like you have to have passion to do this any business like there's a lot of times as a business owner this is not fun like it, it's cripplingly bad have you ever had times where you thought to yourself i can't do this anymore I'm, yeah i'm quitting it yeah like once a week <laughs> sometimes once a day you know it's it, it's one of those things that like you know, like, like I said, you really, you really have to love it. You have to be passionate about it or else you just won't do it. And I still think the hardest thing for me, and again, you know, I, uh, it's hard for me. Cause like, you know, some people tell me I'm young. Some people like, I'm like, well, there's 20 something year olds doing a lot as well. But like, you know, the hardest thing for me was learning how to manage people and creating a team that supported me, that, that was an extension of me. And I have, I have really, really high expectations like really, really high expectations and whatever expectations I have for other people, it's 10 times worse for me. Mm. I beat myself up all the time. Like I want, I want the customer's experience to be perfect. I don't want anybody to be unhappy. I want it to be early. I want it to be better than what they wanted. I want it to be the most amazing experience. And that's a very, very hard thing to do over and over and over and over and over and over and over. You know, we went from a one body kit a week to sometimes 20, 30, 40, 50 orders a week in a span of six years. And it's like, again, getting people to support your brand as their own and support it the way that you love it is very hard. And I've had to, you know, I've had, I've had to learn some different management skills and some personality changes to kind of deal with that. You know, my team gets beat up sometimes, but. But I suppose as a business owner, you've got to learn, you, the only way you can go through this is to learn these things yourself. And then, you know, you having high expectations for your team is a great thing because then that means they know to perform at their best of their abilities. 
Yeah. I, and you know how to run that. Yeah, I, I don't think that like... And, it, and, it, and I suppose if I was to work for your company, I suppose, it's like I am forced to be pushed to my best of my ability to unlock another, another level for myself personally. No, and it's interesting. We we um I stumbled upon a, a coach that I had for myself personally, and I got it from from somebody else that I, I dealt with. And you know, we got into the conversation that he had been integrating himself in that team, and so we have a business coach now that you know we're able to basically look at our individual selves, our individual goals. Um, you know provide feedback to each other of what we think needs to be worked on and we have like a little internal um personal business development of each person that's in my company like i my people are very important to me you know i think we put a lot into you know our people developing as well mm. you know like and it's funny like like my team all the time they're like oh something's hard this this and this i'm like you know they're like oh you're the owner of the company so it's easier for you i'm like where do you think i learned this i was like i just i just like I was like, you guys look at me. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing half the time. I was like, just make it up as I go. I'm like, I'm, there's no like magic anything. I was like, I just, I, I just, you know, it's it's a little bit different. You know, I can decide which risks to take or not. But like, honestly, like I have had nobody teach me this stuff. Do I have great people around me? Yes, I do. But like when it comes down to those decisions of what to do with the business, I'm like, I don't have a magic ball. I'm like, I know what I think works. I know what I like. But sometimes it doesn't work. We've had mm-hmm. some kids flop and others that are great. But like developing our people and then having somebody in between me and my people to help the communication, the relationship, the conversation, like it's been super, super important because I am a very intense person. What do you think is looking back at it or looking back at it throughout the whole time of your entrepreneurship journey? What's the number one struggle of entrepreneurship that people don't recognize? Or don't deal with you know if people come across the social media or maybe they see 1016 and nine designed to be this incredible successful brand the owner must be loving it you know i think what is it the struggle yeah i think people um people don't understand the sacrifices that people that own companies make you know i get it a lot where people are like you know they see they see the cars that i have they see they see what the trips we go on they're like must be nice i'm like oh you got to spend the weekend with your wife and your family i was like that must be nice mm. Like you know, they, always greener on the other side. Yeah, and and you know they don't they don't understand that you know and it, again this has been very hard in personal relationships for me. A lot of people don't understand that I have that mentality. Just oh, we can't go to the movies tonight. Mm. I I got to do this. This is what I need to do. Um, you know I need to I need to not buy myself this because I need to spend the money on the business doing this. You know I'm willing to give up a lot of things. You know like it would be impossible for me. I've been married before. But it would be impossible for me to be married, have kids, and, like, have that part of my life right now, which is something that's really, really important to me. Like, family is everything to me. And so, you know, people just don't understand what um, people, especially developing companies from scratch, like, without funding, without huge money, without whatever, we don't have. Like, I've bootstrapped this the whole time. I've been very smart. You know, I always end up, I always act like we're going broke, even if we're not even close, which we're not. And so, you know, it's really, really stressful. It's it's really difficult. And I think, uh, you know, especially with like online, people are very critical. They're very mean mm. and they're very negative. And like, you know, me personally, like I had to back off my presence. Which is why I said, you know, you got me on camera. I don't like being on camera because I, I, I backed myself out of this online um, online world because people, people just, you know, like, I'm I'm the nicest person in the world. Like I want everybody to succeed. Like you know, I don't I don't feel like you need to be jealous. I don't feel like you need to compete with me. I'm like Everyone come have a conversation with me. You know, if I can, I'll I'll spend the time to talk to you about it. Yeah. If I can help you, I will. If you want to come along with me and be a part of this, absolutely. Yeah. You know, but a lot of people see it. You know, they don't communicate, and then they just end up throwing negativity at it because they don't like where they are. And it's like you know. I, I don't understand that perspective. Again, like I, I'm the type of person where, you know, if I can't help you, I will. Mm. If I can't help you, I'm sorry I can't, but like don't I'm take still here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't take it personally. Don't don't think I whatever. But like, you know, so so again, you know, the sacrifices that people make and the the pressure that we're under as as, you know, people that that, that are really trying to do something different, it, it's a lot. I think one of the main things of entrepreneurship is the circle that you keep around you, right? Yeah. 
whether you have other entrepreneur friends around you or maybe just people with great energy that uplift you all the times. But obviously there are times where you don't have them people in your life. And, and you, you notice struggle, that. And you notice that. Yeah, yeah. So what's it like for you? And if you have great friends, how do you manage to maintain those friendships and those relationships? So I think it's it's not it's not like an entrepreneurial thing, but I think you need to have people around that understand that mentality. As I said, you know, you need to have people that are like, if you haven't called them in a month, like you just pick up the phone and they're fine. Like they're not going to get upset. They're not like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, but, sure, yeah. you know, I, I think for me, like I got into a cycle of like, it last maybe last year I had the wrong group of people around me and just like the the way that I talked, my attitude, my productivity, everything just was not where it needed to be. And luckily I, I caught it. But, you know, again, I think I think you need like minded people, you know, for for me. You know, I need people that believe that my crazy ideas are possible. Yeah. Um, people that have, you know, made their own crazy ideas possible. And I, I genuinely do believe that I surround myself with people that are more successful than I am. I'm not jealous. I, I clap for them every single step of the way. Like they, they, you know, whether I'm doing poorly that month, that year, that week, like whatever, you know, I have a group of people that like we all support each other, you know, all getting bigger. Mm. And and that's been super important. You know, we don't have any jealousy. We don't, we don't really ever fight with each other. But again, it's having that mindset of, of building, building something different. Yeah. I think, you know what, it, it, even looking at relating to exactly what you just said, yeah. One of my best friends, we, me and him throw crazy each other, uh, ideas at each other all the time. Crazy ideas. Anyone else we throw the um, ideas to? They say, you're just being stupid. Relax yourself. Yeah. Whereas me and him were like, yeah, let's go for it. Let's do it. And I think those are the friends you need because... They I think you also you. need the friends that are telling you you're being stupid too, though. Yeah. Like, that's, that's the one thing that I think it frustrates me the most about, again, this current generation of kids. It's like, they can't take a punch. No. They can't. They take. They can't no, take the any feedback. Next generation's weak, man. No, they, they can't take any feedback. I'm like, I'm like, honestly, like, I am so appreciative of my friends that maybe at the time I didn't want to hear it, but they tell me the truth. And again, that's where I get into a lot of conflict with people because I'm not that person that can't tell you the truth. Mm. It's a really, really positive but unfortunate part of my personality that I will always tell you the truth. I will Regardless always be what honest with you. I don't care if you get mad. I don't care if it upsets you. Like, I just, I unfortunately am not that person that lies to people to tell yeah. them what they want to hear. Yeah. And that served me very well in business. But personally, it's been, it's been difficult. But like my friend group, if I'm being stupid or if I'm doing something out of pocket or if I'm out of line or yeah, whatever, I have, I have a group check. people that keep you in check. Yeah, yeah like, absolutely. Yeah, because every, every idea is not a good idea. Most ideas are not good ideas. Yeah. Look, you're in your 30s now. I'm creeping up in my 30s, right? Yeah. Do you think the next generation have got it pretty easy? You know, it's, 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 my staff is all younger, but I've, again, through the process I, I mentioned with like our business coach and like our personal development, stuff like that, I've, you know, I've brought them, people that are going to stay with us, like they need to change their behavior to match what will make them successful. And I think, unfortunately, I think there's been way too much capability for them to have access to things that 10 years ago or a decade ago, I didn't have access to, you know, like I needed to prove income to get a Huracan. Mm. I needed to have all this stuff. And like, it, again, it's been more flexible as people see an opportunity, but I think that, you know, there's just, a, it's just a generation that just expects that they're going to get all this stuff because they exist and they don't want to work for it. Mm. I, I, I really don't know how it's going to go. Honestly, like, like with the amount of money, and again, it's amazing. Social media is amazing, but the amount of money that people can make just being popular online, it's like, okay, well, for a certain amount of time, it's probably pretty successful. And again, there's a lot of people that can make it work, but it, like for the vast majority of people, they're not going to have a huge channel and have a hurricane. I, like I also feel that it makes people lazy as well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, hard work is something that, that I think is going to be a challenge, you know, but as I said, like, you know, there's a lot of people that do very well with it. But, you know, we were talking about this in, on the car on the way over. It's like, I think it's almost like, it's not like, I don't want to say it's like a, a mental disease, but it's like, it's like a mental, like, like I, I feel bad for them because, you know, you have people believing that if you buy likes and comments yeah. or you buy engagement, it's validation that it, that it, that it somehow changes the fact that from a realistic standpoint, you're not a successful person yeah 
it's not to say you're not successful, but it's like to base your to base your mental uh your mental ego. You, yeah, your 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 well being and like how you feel about yourself based on you know likes. You're comments, seeing you're seeing yes. two thousand likes, but you've bought five hundred of them. But somehow you're like, well, I have two thousand likes, so it's better. Yeah. But it's like you're happy about buying things that aren't. Re- it's it's you know it's almost like materialism, but not in a way of cars and luxury. It's like just to make yourself feel good. Yeah, and it's like and I you know, so like I, I it. it it's sad for me because, you know, like, and again, like I've worked really hard and I wish everybody had access to who I have access to, which is, he's an absolutely life changing person and he's not expensive. He's not whatever, but you know, I he's wish your coach. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. And he's between LA and Miami. Um, and he works with my family. He works with my team, you know, anybody that is willing to get help, I recommend. And, and, you know, he's been very successful as a real result too, but you know, like, I just wish people would understand that, you know, communication, personal interaction, things like that are what are going to make you feel good. They're what are going to get you ahead in life. They're, they're the things that are going to change your life. It's not, you know, refreshing your Instagram every five seconds to see your like count. Yeah. I don't give, I, I don't care what my don't like care. Is. I, yeah. I don't care. Like, you know, I do from the perspective of, of, of analytics. Okay. Are we reaching the right people? Are, is our company getting where it needs business, to go? It? Yeah. 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 It's, it's different. And I definitely got sucked into it. Like, like, like my, my like personal, like, and business thing got sucked together. And, you know, I'm glad that I changed my perspective, but it's just like, it, it's really, I don't, I don't know, frustrating. It's just like, I, I feel, I feel bad, you know, like, Again, you know, somewhere somewhere along the line, people decided that social media was a way of classifying you as a person. Mm. Um, you know, like these girls that like do face face tune and stuff like that, and like all this stuff. I'm like, we realize that people meet you in person, and that's not you. I'm like, you don't you don't need to necessarily be do, a certain yeah. way. And if you do want to be that way, there's maybe things you can do, like working out or like whatever. But it's like you know people people will completely change their entire identity but it's like at the end of the day why is that more important than meeting somebody in person and being honest with them about who you are what you need what you want what you look like i'm like yeah. it, that really it, some of these some of these face tunes it's like come on like this this is really interesting right because you're one of the three people i've had in the podcast who have a coach so i want to ask you directly what differences have you seen in yourself having a coach so i think i think for me there were there were a lot of there were a lot of things that you know i am 34 so from my perspective i still feel like i'm young but from certain perspectives i'm really not like there's a lot of other people like married have kids families whatever and like i just i'm still like floating around playing around being a moron and there were certain things that like, you know, whether it was from childhood or, or, or my past, whatever that I was hanging on to that I didn't know were the reasons that I was acting childish or that a reason I was acting in a certain way or the reason that I was impatient, like whatever. And as I've looked at, you know, deeper into some of the things that have caused those behaviors, we've, we've been able to change those behaviors. So how I talk to myself, how I talk to others, how my patience works, how, you know, I definitely have matured and, you know, like, I don't want drama. I don't like drama. I don't, I, I don't like conflict. Like, you know, like it's just enabled me to, I would say, find myself again, you know, find, find who I am and be, be comfortable with it. And, you know, a lot of people don't like that change because I've pushed away, not pushed away, but I just, I don't respond or I don't react. Or I think one of the biggest things that bothers people is they used to be able to get a reaction out of me. They used to get me to like jump, Take, snap, yeah. change, you know, whatever. And now I'm like, I either hand it off to one of my team or I just don't react to it. Like, mm. and I think that's hard for people. And I think, you know, it's interesting for, for real reasons or not. A lot of people don't like me because of my past behavior. And a lot of people don't like me because of my current behavior. It's like, but I'm a lot happier with my current behavior. Like I, I, I believe that some of the people have very good reasons. You know, I was a hothead. I had a huge ego. I was very arrogant. I was very like, I had, I lost who I was when, when I started to climb, you know, like I, but I wasn't happy with myself. And there's a lot other going on in my personal life that a lot of people don't know about. Um, 
And, you know, like it's, it's nice being comfortable with myself and being okay with the fact that not everybody likes me, but at least now, like I said, like, you know, it, it, it may be for a reason that they don't get the time they want from me. They don't get the access. They don't get like, a lot of people just, that's another thing. A lot of people think it's like everybody else's job to take care of their life. Yeah. Like, and, and, you know, I've protected my own energy. I've protected my team. I've pr protected what I want to do. And it, you know, again, it's, it's been nice for me. I'm a lot calmer. I'm a lot more, more uh, confident. I'm a lot happier, but a lot of people just don't take it very well. Have you found that as you climb up the ladder of success, you lose more of yourself? I think, um, I think if you don't take care of yourself, the answer is yes. And I think I didn't even understand, you know, like I, you hear it time and time again, like, and I, I have blessed to have amazing family and morals and, and, you know, what I learned from my family, but you know, like it, it's, it's like, it is a cliche. It's like, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take other, take care of other people. Yeah. And I, until I like lost myself and until I literally was at a point like mental break, like physically I was 120 pounds more. Like I lost 120 pounds in the last year and got myself back into shape. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Lot, yeah. And, and so it took me losing myself and not taking care of myself to understand that. But it's really true. Like, if you don't take care of your health, if you don't take care of your mental health, if you don't take care of how you feel about yourself, you really can't do much for other people. And that, that you know, being successful got me to that point. You know, as I got successful, I gained all this weight. I, I stopped sleeping. I kept pushing myself, you know, like, oh, I can catch up on sleep next week. Oh, yeah. you know, like, whatever. That, next that, week never comes. Never, no, never. <laughs> Six years later, next, next week. Next yeah. week is right now. Yeah. This is first. This is the first time. It was like, next week, I was like, I'm just going to stay here. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to stay here for another week. If the world collapses around me because something happens at home, I was like, <laughs> it is what it is. So, you, you know, obviously you were meant to leave today. Yeah. Yeah. Did you extend for that reason to think, you know what? I need just a bit of rela relaxation time. Yeah, I need it. 100%. Like, you, you know, we're, and we're not really in a, in a point right now where I want to take a week off. We have yeah. a lot going on. Like we just released the Range Rover kit. And we have to fix quite a lot and redo it which I want to get done as soon as possible yeah. to make the product perfect. But I really was like, you know what? Like I'm here. I haven't been out of the country in a long time. I kind of knew that I was going to do this. Like I know myself really well at this point. So yeah. like I almost like I left it a little bit open-ended so I could do this. I feel like you need to though for your mental health and your mental yeah. sanity, man. Yeah. Because I mean, when you push yourself that hard and, and like I said, you know, it, there is a very tough phase in business and, we're in that phase. Like, like you, you, you can find some original success, but then getting the ability to um, copy paste, take that to another level and then expand that out that, that, that like first jump that you have as success and then trying to scale it again and repeat. That's where it's really hard. Mm -hmm. That's where we're at building yeah. the team, building the repeatability, you know, stupid stuff like, you know, more cost effective, effective packaging, marketing, going to different continents, like all this stuff, like you, you take something that worked well in one environment and at one scale, and then you're like, okay, we need to blow it up a hundred times as much. And it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very frightening. Yeah. It's for sure. Like, do you, do you know what? I have it as well, where in times of, of where I need mental clarity to figure out where I'm going, what I'm doing and how I'm going to do it mainly. And sometimes my head gets too clogged up. I find the best thing for me to do is take a break. Yeah, and I know it's so hard to take a break, but you need to because if you want to strive and, you know, continue going up the ladder, you need to eventually just pause for a second. But you need good people to help you do that. You need good people to help you do that 100%. Yeah. Usually, a lot of the time I travel to the buyer by my own. That's, that's the way I do it and just have mental clarity there and literally just chill. I mean, I'm super OCD and it's like, I think the hardest part of, business for me was letting go of my baby to other people mm. and trusting other people to have the same uh, passion and drive passion drive and and quality of service and that's been a huge struggle for me and i think that's the point where it it really becomes like a real business it really it really takes another shape is you know again having support where you need it in every aspect of what we do i mean 
we make a very difficult product. We make a very difficult product to do good every time. We make a very difficult product to ship. I mean, like the last couple of years is problems that we just never expected to have. Never in my life would I have thought in the last couple of years I would have to hire so many people to do transit and logistics. It was a nightmare to get people their products during COVID. I can imagine. Like big boxes, all that sort of stuff. No, but it, it was things that like, you know, like they, you know, things that were very structured, like, you know, rates were structured for, for transit. And like during COVID, they're like, your rates valid for 24 hours. And if we didn't get the package out, it could go from 2000 to 11,000. Crazy. And what are you going to tell your client? Mm. So we had to just eat it. You have to take the hit yourself. Yeah. So like things like that where, you know, the last couple of years I think has been uniquely positive, uniquely negative. And like just things that you, you know, again, as an entrepreneur, it's like just because you don't see it coming doesn't mean you don't have to just figure it out. Yeah. And that's been, that, that was a challenge for us. The, the transit portion of everything was just, you know, and then obviously it was lucky that our type of business was a, uh, qualified in the u.s is like um uh what was the word they used uh like a necessary business so automotive based businesses because they needed repair and stuff like that like okay yeah we could stay open we never closed so we were lucky but you know like i have so many friends that have businesses where they were just businesses that require people being able to be there and go into work and it's like so many of my friends you know just saw their entire journey get ripped apart and it's not like they did anything wrong. It's just, it's just cause they call so it, it. And seeing, and seeing like everybody, you know, band together best they could and make the opportunity and figure out how to make it work. You know, it, it was pretty unique thing in the world. Unique experience. Yeah. You mentioned in this podcast, right? Not too long ago that you, I don't, I don't know how much you want to get into this. So feel free to stop me at any point. Yeah. You mentioned that you were married. I'm interested to know, is that something that was sacrificed along the way of you building this company? Yeah, I think um, it's, you know, relationships in general have been very difficult. And um, that, I was just too young in the first place, and it was right when I started my business. And so it took a mental toll on me that made being my partner difficult. Um, I'll take as much blame as I can. Some of it was just circumstance. Some of it just, like I said, you know, um, I was 24, so she was 21, 22. So asking somebody that age that all of her friends are out having fun and stuff like that, asking her to not go do that stuff and support me and, you know, be there for me and, you know, skip out on a really important important part of life for me to build this, it just wasn't something that clicked mm. for her. And for better or worse, that's what ended up happening. And, you know, I spent three years after that without a relationship. Um, had one after that that was not the best. And, you know, like it just, it's one of those things where, yeah, it's, it's, it's just kind of like collateral damage. And it's, it's very hard, like, you know, because like uh, to balance a lot of girls have said they, they understand it and they appreciate it and they get it. They don't. Mm, when you're in the situation they really like like when i say like this comes first and i'm willing to sacrifice whatever i really mean it like it's super important to me and it's really hard telling somebody that something you've been working on your whole life is more important than going on vacation or whatever and, and i i have to accept if somebody leaves because they need that and i understand it like i need that too but it's more important to me that that this goes where it needs to go. And then later in life, we're where I want to be. And I have a hundred other people that take care of it. That's my time. Yeah. It's not my time right now. Yeah. My time belongs to this or that's whatever else I want to do. Cause it's not the only business I have. I have other things that, you know, we, we do as well. And so, yeah, it's been, that, that's been, that's been a really hard thing for me, but like, you know, I've also had that situation where I had, I had one relationship almost drag me out of my business it, you know, because the, there was guilt and, the, and, you know, attachment issues and stuff like that. And again, that was, that enabled me to go do this work and be a better person as a result. So it's like happy that it happened. Wasn't really a great time, but you know, 
I think having a business has also been a, a great experience while it's also been difficult. So I don't so, know what I, I don't know what I would do without it to be honest with you. I've, I've had many people say and agree it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah, because like I worked for somebody else, I would never do that again. Yeah, no, no, can't do it. Yeah, literally can't do it. Well, Peter, I'm gonna end this on a positive message. I want you to tell me where do we speculate the brand going? Where do you envision it in the next ten years? I mean, 10 years is a long time. We, we have a lot to do in the next, you know, couple of years. Okay, um, well, what's coming up for the future, shall we say? So I think um, we will have a much broader range of products, not just carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. We have partners to do exhaust wheels, uh, plug and play ECUs. And then we have partners that we're working with. Obviously, we're sitting in a facility like that, that yep. we will do full certified turnkey out the door cars um you know of of a certain range of products that we have mm -hmm. and so you know that's that's kind of the next i mean based on the economy right now i have no idea what exactly the timeline is it shifted but yeah. um you know we we want to get into that in the next couple of years and then obviously we have a um uh very different business of making parts and manufacturing and development for other people um, that's super important to me as a, as a long-term goal and something that I want to do. So, you know, that's where you'll see <clears throat> us go and obviously increasing capacity even more and getting better at what we do, more efficient, um, adding people. And yeah, uh, you know, we, you've seen us focus a lot on luxury SUV. Um, we just let, uh, launched the Range Rover Vogue for the 23 um, for all the models for that, which is something that if you told me I would be doing Range Rover kits, I would have laughed in your face. But I think it's something that is needed, that people want, and is accessible. So you're asking about lower end models. I mean, it's still a very expensive vehicle. Um, and then obviously we we're talking about the G wagon as well. Something we need to add to our portfolio. Um, I think we're very unique in that we're covering Porsche exotics, luxury SUV. Mm. It's taking on everybody at once. Yeah. Um, so I think I think it you'll see. An end though. Huh? It works hand in hand because half the time with these clientels that you've got, I'm sure you've got people who own the Porsche for the weekend. They own a Range Rover for the kids, take them to school everywhere or for their wives. Yep. And then they own the Aventadors for themselves, the weekend toy. Correct. But traditionally, you'll see that covered by two or three brands. Mm. And again, these two or three brands probably have been around in business longer than I've been alive. And we're trying to take them on five years in. So it's... It's a lot of work. It's a lot of <laughs> trial and error, I guess. But uh, I think we now, for the first time in our business, have the manufacturing power, the setup, everything we need to now, moving forward, do what we do really well in a different way. Like complete package, everything available. Um, so yeah, it's a, like I said, you know, getting to fully built vehicles is is what I want. And then, like I said, I don't know if it'll be 10 years, but I eventually would love to be able to offer our clientele something we've created from scratch. Mm. And that's something that's very, very important to me and I'm very passionate about. Yes, yes. Yeah. And the last message, uh, last question I got for you, Peter, is what's the message you would leave to your younger self? Be patient. I don't know. They probably won't be able to read it, but... You got it tatted on you. Yeah. Patience, patience is, you know, it. there's a... There's a time and a place for everything. Um, and you just have to believe that that's the case. Things don't happen ahead of when they're supposed to. And no matter how much you wear yourself out, it's not going to change it. Yeah. Um, so that that's my biggest thing is like, you'll get where you need to go. You just need to be patient. And you need to go through the process. There's no shortcuts. No shortcuts at all. And every time you try and take a shortcut, it actually probably makes you, you take go in the long way. Yeah. That's the hardest thing for me is like, stop trying to rush because when you rush, you're going to end up taking four times as long. That's really, it's really true. Like, honestly, like without exception. And I actually learned that from the OEM business too. Mm. Every single time they're like, oh, we need to compress this two weeks shorter. We're going to do it this complete different way and it's going to work. It's like, okay, well now we're six months past the original way. It's like, yes. without failure, like every single time you try and reinvent something that works for you and get there faster, it generally doesn't work very well. Do you struggle with that now? Because, you know, with, with these brands, for example, the new Revy Rev I don't even know how to say it. The new Lamborghini that's going to come out, right? Yeah. You're going to get, you know, yourself and competing brands making a kit for this. Is it a case of who releases it first? 
Oh. So, so the first thing is like, A, it's a clout thing and B, like, okay, you're going to get the first orders, but then you get the gap of people that don't want products. And then a year later you want everybody, everybody that's getting it done wants the product. Mm -hmm. So I think I don't have to be first. I just want to be the best. That's the best way to do it. I mean, we're doing the G wagon four or five years after it's out. And I think we have a, you, I, I get on I'm not going to be arrogant and say the best. I just think we have a unique perspective of how to do that program that's different, that works for the client base that we have. Um, so I don't, yeah, being first is cool. I've never been the person that's like first in the world. And then, who cares? Like, whatever. I just want to know that the product is designed properly, it's well thought out, and it serves our customers the best that it can. So I have my own ways of getting information before a lot of other people because I have a lot of really good relationships like that Revuelto, I will have the data for it before the end of August. So I can start developing that kit if I want in August. The reason we got the Eurus done so fast is because we had the data a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, like we've also been cautious that all the delays with COVID, all the delays with all the supply chain issues, you're still just seeing it now. Yeah. Um, you know, being first is not necessarily the best. You're seeing recalls back of like the Artura, you know, you, and again, like you, you get those first five or six clients and you get your product out there and it is good that people will associate your brand with that product right away. But I think, um, you know, for me again, I'm okay with competition and I'm okay if, you know, we lose some sales, but I am not okay with putting a product out there. That's not the best that we can do. E. So, that's kind of how I look at it. Peter, I've really, really enjoyed this podcast. I think it's been an amazing conversation to have with you. And it's it's surreal for me. Like I said, you know, from from seeing your cars all over YouTube, being my favorite brand, all the way from the States, you know, my, my, I definitely want to come to the States, do a part two of you, go walk around the factory and just, you know, yeah, it's, it's be cool, man. There's a lot of cool stuff to show. A lot we we haven't really shown it yet. Like I said, I've, I've, I've been a little bit quiet about uh, as we... Uh, as we clean up our act, yeah, <laughs> I wanna I wanna show people when it's like exactly the vision of the future that I wanted to see. So we've been, you know, like I said, we've been very quiet about sharing a lot of things because yeah. I, I like just showing people. Yeah, yeah. I don't like talking about it. I like just, just you know, show, like, show, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Peter, where can people find you? Uh, I mean, my personal Instagram is at Peter Northrop. So I'm sure you can put it up yep, there. And yep, then sure. Nine Design and Ten Sixteen Industries are other two socials. Yep. So those are the two companies we have. Obviously, kind of do the same thing. So yeah. make sure you get following people. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share if you like this podcast. If you did like it, like it, share it with other people, comment your feedback. And until then, I'll see you in the next episode. I'll see you cast. Peace. Peace.